Hello, I'm Matthew Malcolm with Pacific Nut Producer Magazine reporting to you from uh, Pistachio Day with the UC Cooperative Extension in Visalia. I'm here with Houston Wilson from the UC Cooperative Extension at the Kearney Ag Center. Uh, one of the things that we talked about today, obviously navel orange worm, you can't go a uh, tree nut meeting without talking about navel orange worm. It's a constant issue in California. We had some, especially some, some bigger issues in the northern valley that, you know, this past year that we're not necessarily used to. Suffice to say, it's an ongoing problem, and there has been some interest in sterile insect technology uh, to to control these populations and we, we got some funding from the government to be able to work on the mass rearing of these in, in Phoenix at the sterile insect uh, technology facility there. Uh, along with the excitement of that, we're also having some, some great research going on at the uh, Kearney Ag Center with Houston here. Can you tell us about it? Sure. So when the Phoenix facility was first converted over to produce sterile navel orange worm there's there's a lot of concerns about you know the impacts of the mass rearing and the sterilization and the shipping and the release process on the competitive ability of those moths so essentially like is it really going to work you yeah know? is this going to be a viable tool that we can use for control of navel orange worm so uh, myself along with chuck burks with usda ars uh, also in parlier what we've been doing over the past two years is working with that facility and working with the moths coming out of that facility uh, to evaluate their performance in a variety of field and laboratory based assays. So the whole idea with sterile insect technique is that you're able to get a moth that's that's sterile uh, to mate with wild moths but but still competitive and it can it can outcompete even a wild male for for the attention of a female or, or vice versa, right? So the work we've been doing, um, there's a whole number of factors that could be having a negative influence on, on the ability of these moths to perform normally under field conditions. So um, in, in 2018, we, we saw that the females were, the sterile females were able to effectively call wild males, uh, albeit there was a little adjustment period on the first night uh, after their release. They, they're coming out of this facility. It seems like they might need to be adjusting to the photo period to kind of get in sync. Um, this is a nocturnal insect. So Maybe they got a little jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> if you were raised in a factory and shoved in a box and shipped to California <laughs> and then thrown out into a pistachio orchard, probably finding a, a mate wouldn't necessarily be the first thing on your priority list. <laughs> no, that's, that's too much analogy. But um, there's definitely something about the photo period that, that seemed to make the females uh, behave a little bit differently, but, but really only on that first night. The males, in 2018, we had very low recovery. We were releasing them and we could never recover them uh, in, in pheromone traps or, or other platforms that we were using to recover moths. And so that was a major concern going into this past year. And right. what we were able to do this year is uh, a variety of things. We, we put the sterile males into a wind tunnel and had them uh, tested to see if they would respond to female pheromone. And, and indeed they did. There was some concern that in the, the rearing facility, they might have lost the ability to, to follow a plume of pheromone to a female, but that's, that's not the case. So uh, the, the moths coming out of that facility, the males do, do follow pheromone plumes, so they could ostensibly locate a female in the field. We also modified the release mechanism, so the way we were releasing them into our field plots uh, seemed to be having an effect on, on their ability to disperse for, for whatever reason, probably something related to their, their movement out of this this mass rearing facility into the field. So we did something very, very basic, and this isn't um, anything that would be the basis for a commercial program at scale, but we started putting them in a different uh, sort of a paper bag to release them, and that seemed to give them more vertical space, and, and for whatever reason, that, that seemed to lead to them dispersing quite quite a bit more uh, than what we were seeing previously. So, so that was a good um, advance. Uh, and we, we hope in, in 2020 to continue looking at the effects of, of that release mechanism um, as well as the, the shipping and the mass rearing process itself. So we also ran some flight mill studies. It's kind of like a treadmill for a moth. You put them on this device and they, they fly round and round and you can measure how far they're able to fly uh, in a given night. And what we saw is that the moths coming out of the Phoenix facility didn't fly as well as our as our kind of wild type control moth. And when we took that strain of moth from the Phoenix facility and, and produced it locally at, at 
at Parlier, we saw that they would fly very well. And so it's not necessarily the strain of moth in that facility, it's whatever conditions they're being subjected to in that production process and in that shipping process. So there is one factor that we're really going to start off with uh, in 2020 is, is the cold chill that these moths are subjected to. So if you think about mass rearing, you know, hundreds of thousands of moths and then you're trying to package them up and ship them, uh, commonly they are, and, and in the Phoenix facility process, um, they cool them in order to ship them so that they're calm while in transit and then you, you bring them out to the field and uh, they should recover from that and, and, and go about doing what they do. We think that there may be something to do with how much chill they're being given that could affect their ability to recover that may actually be causing some damage to the moths and making them um, not disperse um, as readily as they would uh, when we locally produce them and don't chill them. So that's one factor uh, in addition to the release mechanisms and that we're going to be evaluating in 2020. There's, there's, there's some other sub-studies and things like that, but the takeaway is that we've at least been able to start recovering these moths uh, under field conditions. We've identified some of the key factors that seem to be having a negative impact on, on their performance in previous trials and, and sort of know where to go, I guess. Because when we first started this work in 2018, you could, you could list about 50 different things that might be causing a problem. And we've simply gone about trying to isolate each of those variables through various experiments and see what, what makes them tick, you know, and what makes them perform better or worse. And, and I think we have a better grasp of that now. Right. going into this third year of field trials. So when do you anticipate the commercialization of, of the sterile insect? Well, that's a good question, and it came up quite a bit today. Um, it's hard to say. So we're familiar with a number of other sterile insect and, and specifically sterile moth programs uh, globally. And all those efforts have been multi-year if not multi-decade, you know, research and development processes. There's there's so many moving pieces to a program like this um, that it, it certainly takes some time to develop. Were we in a best case scenario, and this is kind of the best, best case scenario, say we were able to have the moth become fully competitive, you know, uh, this this year in 2020. By the end of this year, we, we say, okay, this moth looks good. It's, it's a strong flyer. It's able to find, you know, wild moths, uh, et cetera. There's going to be another phase that we have to move into where we run a series of field trials to develop that, what we refer to as the over-flooding ratio, to figure out how many, exactly how many sterile moths you need to put out into an orchard and what time of year you need to do that in order to have a downward effect on populations and ultimately crop damage. So that's, you know, a couple more years of studies like of that nature. And then taking it to another phase where you're trying to figure out how to integrate that uh, technology with the use of other IPM tools that exist for naval orange worms, such as mating disruption and crop sanitation and things like that. So I think one of the most apparent contradictions is the use of mating disruption with sterile insect techniques. So if you're trying to disrupt males from finding females uh, with pheromones, but then you throw sterile moths in there, and, and the idea is ostensibly for them to find the wild insects, you're kind of right. doing a contradictory thing. So there's programs where they have, have worked out ways to integrate those two things and kind of separating them in space and in time and, um, or alternately figuring out how to prioritize areas that should, should be under mating disruption versus use of sterile insect introductions, um, things like that. I, again, I don't have a direct answer for, for what that would look like, but the, the point here is that it's certainly going to be you know something at least like five more years if, if not more right. to get to a point where we have a, a strong commercially viable program and that's that's not uncommon for a sterile moth or sterile insect program it's just an incremental series of experiments to develop the moth to figure out how to move it release it and, and actually have an effect on on crop damage so well, thank you, Houston, for taking the time, and we appreciate all the efforts of the UC Cooperative Extension and other researchers that are involved in this in this project, uh, both in Phoenix and here at the Kearney Ag Center. Like you said, this sterile insect technique has worked; it's just proven to work in, in other industries and other insects. So, you know, just 
can just hang on and, and rely on these uh, trusty uh, researchers and it just it'll take some time and obviously some more funding than we got just this year to, uh, to, to keep the program going. But we look forward to hearing more about it in the future. Read more about it in Pacific Net Producer Magazine. I'm Matthew Malcolm, CaliforniaAgNet.com.